Hi everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Ram. This is going to be a talk about an open source project I did a few years back called PySnooper. PySnooper is a debugging tool, and this talk is going to be about showing you how it can be useful for you, and also, also talking a little bit about what goes into making a popular open source project. Now, I, I've been doing open source for years, and I've always tried to do a project that's going to go viral, and, and most it failed, and I had only a couple of successes, and this was one of them. So I so, sort of tried to analyze what, what went right there. Uh, about myself, uh, my name is Ram. I've been a Python activist for a long time, a software developer. Uh, my, my two popular projects are PySnooper and Python Turtle, and I've contributed to some of the big projects like CPython, Django, PyPy, and a bunch more. Um, I, I'm going to give a lightning talk about my research. So now I'm working full time on research in machine learning, called using machine, machine learning to understand our society. It's research in a, in a field of machine learning called multi-agent reinforcement learning. And that's now the thing that's uh, the most interesting to me. So shameless plug, please come to my lightning talk. It's going to be the one that's first today. Um, so uh, this talk is about a debugging tool. I'm going to show you the GitHub page for PySnooper. Feel free to make fun of me if you're using Windows. Yes, so this is the GitHub page for PySnooper, and I posted it online back in uh, 2019, and it got super popular. It has, it has 15,000 stars for a project I worked just a few weeks on. So I, I was very happy with that. I put it on Hacker News. It went viral there. It went to the top page. Lots of people tweeted about it and posted it on Reddit and then started it, and I, I was very happy to make something, something popular. Um, so let's talk a little bit about debugging, and then I'm going to try to explain what is PySnooper and, and how it can be useful to you. Oh, I, I want to say, if you have questions, unlike the other talks, I will appreciate if you just ask questions during the talk. So feel free to interrupt me and ask questions about anything. So uh, let's talk about debugging. Uh, let's say I got a piece of code that I'm running, and it's not doing what I think it should be doing. Like, either I get an exception or the result isn't what, what I expected it to be. So I'm a big fan of using classic debuggers, like old school debuggers. This is the Wing ID. Most of you probably never, you've never used it, uh, but it's basically similar to PyCharm or VS Code. And I, I've got a piece of code here that's sort of my, my, my case study. And what it does, it takes a number and converts it in, into binary, in, into bits. And let's say I want to understand what's going on here. And so I can put a breakpoint anywhere, and I can run the code, and and the debugger is just going to stop on that line. And I can uh, press the F6 in, in the case of Wing ID, and it's just going to go step by step through the lines. And every time it goes through the lines, I can find out uh, the, the values of the variables there. I can ask, what is the value of the variable number? Or what is the, the value of the number remainder? And I can even, if I could, I could, if I wanted, I could also run any kind of code that I want. It would just modify things there. So for me, I mean, th this isn't anything new. I've used tools like this uh, when I was developing in C and Pascal when, when I was a child. So, so this is very classic. It's, and, and, I mean, it's not new. And I, I love to use this tool. I mean, I use debugger whenever I can. It's, it's amazing. And when I started working professionally as a developer, like in Python, I looked at people around me who were working, and they weren't using debuggers at all. Like they were using print statements in the code. Like whenever they wanted to understand what's going on, like there was a bug, they would like add more print statements or log statements or temporarily and delete them and sort of see the, see the output. And that's, like when I saw it first, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is a, such a great tool. Why, why wouldn't anyone use it? Um, so th this is my explanation for that. Like the, the debuggers are awesome. So, so many tools, so many, it's so powerful. But to get it set up is a nightmare. I, I've, shown you, I've shown you using a debugger on just one file on my computer, and it's seemed easy. I just pressed the F5 and it ran. But if you are developing at work, you're not running the code on your own computer. It's on a separate computer, maybe in a Docker or a VM or in a different operating system or a different uh, country. And getting a debugger to connect from your computer to that remote computer, that's very difficult. Like, I've done it a lot of times. I can, I, can, I can even say I'm an expert at setting up remote debuggers, and, and I think it sucks. I mean, it's so difficult. The source mapping always fails. Something always fails. And, and I'm so I've, I've done that when I worked for companies, but most people don't want to do that. 
And I think that's part of the reason why many people, when something doesn't work for them, what they end up doing is this. And this text is visible. Let's make it bigger. Okay. And then they see the output, and then they get a clue for what's going on in the function. And they can, and they can understand that they don't have the input, the output they wanted, so they add more print lines. And then they understand they wanted to expose more variables than they did. And when you run it that way, you get, you get an idea for what's happening in the function. So this works, and so debug by print works, but I have very mixed feelings about it. I mean, on one hand, I hate it, because it is such a crude tool. Like, you have to go in there and put the print statement yourself. I mean, just the fact that you have to modify your code to debug it is something offensive to me. And you have to put in these print functions, and then you have to reproduce the problem that happened, which can take a few minutes, right? And then you run it, and then you look at the print output to inspect what happened, and then you realize you haven't exposed the variables you wanted to expose, so you go back and you do it again. And this sort of back and forth, like I've seen developers doing it all the time, and it was so sad, I mean, so, so he, he, here was my thinking. On the one hand, we got the classic debuggers that are very powerful, but difficult setup. On the other hand, we got the method of debug by print, which is very weak, but easy to set up, which is why everybody's using it. So I said, I'm gonna make a compromise. I'm gonna create a solution that is, okay, not as powerful as a debugger, but pretty powerful, more powerful than print, and as easy to set up as print. So that's PySnooper. Let me, let me demonstrate how to use it. I'm gonna delete the, this old uh, print statements. So I imported PySnooper, and I decorated my function with PySnooper.snoop. There were a bunch of uh, options that, that are possible here, but uh, I'm gonna show them later. Now when I run the code, I'm gonna get this. Let's scroll up. So basically, it's like, instead of playing the game of putting a print statement here, or a street print statement there, it's like going all in. It's like I want a print statement everywhere. Every time something run, runs, I wanna know what happens. All right, so, so yes, it, it does create like a huge dump of text. It's basically it's similar to, to set minus six that you have for bash. It, you can think of it as set minus six for Python. And it, it, it is nice to get that text dump. I mean, it's a bit big. It can be difficult if you got big function, but it's like, it's like an automatic log of everything that happened. Every line that ran and every variable that got declared, right? This is actually a variable that gets modified. Every time a variable gets modified, it prints out the variable that uh, the new value. Every time a variable gets declared, it, uh, it prints the value of the variable. So basically, you can sort of like, sort of like an X ray of exactly what happened in your function. So it, it's a, it's a, instead of having the back and forth with a print, just put PySuper on it, see the whole thing. And of course, you can, you can do all kinds of fancy things, like uh, the, the first argument is you can uh, direct it to a file, and then see the output in a file instead of on the shell. And you can also put a callable there uh, for you to call the callable instead, instead of printing. Uh, more cool options. Uh, one cool option is watch. Watch is basically the same as a watch expression in a debugger. So I can put any kind of, I, I put a variable here, but I'm already getting the variables for free. Uh, but I can put any kind of expression in there. If I'm gonna put sum of bits, and then I'm gonna run it, it's gonna track some sum of bits. And every time the sum of the bits changes, it's gonna show the, the current sum. So any kind of Python expression I can put there, just like a debugger. Any questions so far, feel free to interrupt me with questions, just step up to, to the mic if you have any. No, I'll, I'll repeat the question, just ask. Okay, okay, you actually have to move the mic, I can't understand you. <laughs> yeah. So my question was like, there's some bits which is a string, 
Th there's a what? The sum bit, if you go. Yes, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back, yeah. So it's, it's kind of a string, so can it also identify if there is some syntax error in that? Um, this is a good feature for, some, for a strong, powerful tool, which PyStopper is not. PyStopper is a cute toy. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I, I think that, you know what? You know what? In the spirit of experimentation, let's give it a try. Ah, it failed, which I guess is what you want, right? Yeah, correct. <laughs> because sometimes people had a typo by mistake, like some can be can SM or something because. Yeah. Uh, another useful feature is depth. So I, I will actually have to, to add more code here to, to make it uh, meaningful. So let's say I'm just, uh, I just have code here that calculates the mean of a few numbers. Okay, I'll repeat the question. Uh, the guy was saying, playing devil's advocate, that I am actually uh, modifying the code. And I, I said that I don't like the way that when you use debug by print, you modify the code. And I'm doing the same thing with PySnooper. You are correct. It is, it is the same disadvantage as print. And you, asked, you also asked whether there is a way uh, to enable PySnooper without modifying the code, and, and there isn't, unfortunately. Sorry. Um, another useful feature is depth. Depth basically means Go, go deeper in the, in the function that you're tracing. So if we use depth, actually let's try depth equals one, which is the, the default. With depth equals one, we only get the lines of, of the current function. But if I use depth equals two, it's also going to track any function that my function calls. Right here I'm calling statistics.mean, and every, all the calling statistics.mean is gonna be traced here. And it's, it's nicely indented so I can see that it's a different, uh, it's a different function. It also, it also says where it got the, the source. And I can basically go crazy. Let's do depth equals 10. And actually, this, is even, this isn't even very crazy, but it is, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's not easy to read depth equals 10. But, but the, the nice thing is that it is, it is a static artifact that you can save in a file and then inspect later without having to run your program again and again and again. Uh, let's see if there are any more interesting options. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, thread info is cute. Um, if you're writing multi-threaded multi code, it's gonna, it's gonna show the thread ID for each, each line that runs. So if you have multiple uh, threads going on, you're gonna see which thread is running which line. It's so much for options. Now, um, some people may be wondering, how, how does this magic work? I mean, how do I tell Python please insert a print statement everywhere. And it, it's pretty simple. There is, there is a function called sys.setrace. Oops. sys.setrace. This is part of Python, part of the sys module. It basically tells Python, here is a trace function. Please call this trace function wherever there is a line that runs. And please give the trace function some, some metadata, sorry, Please give the trace function some metadata about what ran. I mean, what kind of line ran, um, whether it was a return from a function or entering into a function, stuff like that. So lots of the code intelligence tools that you use, like debuggers and code coverage uh, measurement tools, they just use um, sys.setrace. And if you, if you want to write your own code intelligence tools, you can do the same. Uh, CPython basically provides the, the actual machinery for that. Okay, so l l let's talk not, not about PySuper itself, but about the experience of making a popular open source project. So like I, I said before that I, I made a bunch of open source projects over the years and many of them failed. Like many of them, I worked on them for months and I was so proud and I'll post on GitHub and nobody cared. I got like two stars from, from my brother and some random press person in it. And, and th this one succeeded and I also have another one that succeeded. So I'm gonna sort of try to share what I did because I know that other people might also be interested in having their open source project be more popular. Excuse me. <clears throat> so lots of the things I'm, I'm gonna say sounds super obvious, but people somehow miss it. Um, so basically, if you have an open source project, it should be very easy for people to discover what's going on and how to use it and how to get started. 
right? You go on a GitHub page for a project, you expect to see a sort of example of usage and what the, pro what the project is, what problem it's solving, and how to install it and stuff like that. And I mean, the frustra frustrating thing is I think everyone can kind of agree that it's obvious, but so many, uh, so many projects don't do that quite right. Like they don't understand that the user has, has like 30 seconds of attention to read, to, to, to read the thing and see that it doesn't suck so they can start using it. So I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show the, the GitHub page in a sec. Uh, also, I, I wanna say that uh, like now I'm getting into research, I'm using more of the data science packages in Python, and I'm seeing that the standard is lower. Like these guys, like if you look in the Python Flask, like Django Flask requests world, I mean, they've got, they've got it down pat. I mean, they're, they're, they're good at understanding that there's a quick, quick start that people have to, that the GitHub page has to be super clear. Data science world, it's a wild west. You can see a package and not, the GitHub page doesn't show how to use it, or there's an example and you try to run it and there's a syntax error in the example, in the example on the readme. Uh, so I, I do wish that more, more uh, people would, would uh, you know, uh, would uphold these, these rules. Um, let, let me show you the page for, for uh, PySnooper. Um, so I got the page for PySnooper, and I, like, now I'm thinking as a marketer, okay? So I came, I came up with this tagline, never use sprint for debugging again, which already sort of like explains the pain points and what I'm trying to solve. And then there is an explanation there, also the comparison to, to set minus six, which makes, makes uh, it very easy for, for people from Bash to understand it. And this, is actually, there, this is actually too much text. Uh, to put an explanation, the explanation of what the problem is, this is actually too long, but it did work. Uh, p p people like the way I wrote uh, what makes PySnooper stand out from all other code intelligence tools. You can use it in your shitty, sprawling enterprise code base without having to do any setup. I just find the pain point and say, this is the thing I am solving. Uh, people like that. And, 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 then, and then, you know, just a sample, uh, an example of usage. Uh, I've got a screenshot of the output. And of course, uh, installation instructions. So pretty straight, straightforward, but so many, so many projects miss that. Uh, about the example of usage, there is something I noticed in the data science world. That sometimes you have a package, and where they would usually have the example of usage on the readme, they say, check out the examples folder to see different examples of the way it's used. And I've, I've recently worked with a package like that that was hard to understand. It's like, uh, um, what I'm saying here is if there's like an, exam, an examples folder with like eight different examples, it feels like you're giving people more, but you're actually giving them less because now I have to go to the examples folder. I don't know which one is the best one. Like I'm, I'm gonna try to choose and one of them isn't gonna work. And then, nobody's gonna, then I will complain and people will say, oh, that, that, that one sucks, try the other one. I mean, as soon as there is a, like the, an official example that works front and center, that there is something very valuable that I think every project should have. If you make an open source project you want it to get popular, I recommend posting. Oops, I recommend posting it on Hacker News, Reddit, Twitter, blog. Um, I, 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 I post it all at once. I also try to get a few friends to upload it. Only dark pattern I recommend. And uh, I mean, sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it doesn't. But it's it's, it's a very nice uh, it's a very nice trip when it does succeed. If there are any questions on that so far, cool. And the very last thing I'm gonna talk about is, I'm gonna talk about PUDB. This is a different debugging tool, not totally related, but since we're talking about debugging and it's an awesome tool that many people don't know about, it, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate it. So I, I, said, I said that, uh, that uh, PySnooper is a sort of compromise between classic debuggers and print functions. And PUDB is sort of a compromise between a GUI and a CLI. Because it's a debugger that kind of feels like a GUI, but it is actually CLI, so you can use it in the shell. You could use it over SSH. Here's what it, it looks like. So, uh. Come on, don't embarrass me. Okay, I'll use my backup Raspberry Pi, let's see. I hope it doesn't suck. Okay. 
Okay, so I've got the same code here, the same uh, fun function number to bits. Let's try to use it with PUDB. So if, you've, if you're old like me and you worked with uh, Boland pro programs in the 90s, it's gonna be very familiar to you. It's, it's, it, so I've got my code here and I can, I can uh, run it like a debugger. And, I, and now I'm pressing the keyboard to tell it to go to, a, to continue on a certain function. Right? I can say, and basically the same kind of demonstration I did with the debugger um, in the GUI, I can do it here in the shell. And I can, do, and I can go into the shell and I can ask uh, for the values of variables and I can travel up and down the stack. Here I'm in the shell and I, and I can ask what is the value of number. Right? I can say, I can ask bits, well bits does, doesn't exist, oh, does exist yet. And I can run any kind of, uh, any kind of Python code I can run in the shell. So basically it's like a sort of like a, sort of a, a toy debugger in the shell. I think it, does, it doesn't do, I think, multi-threading or multi-processing, uh, which is a shame, but still, very awesome, awesome tool. The fact you can just SSH to a remote server and have a, a debugger like that is awesome. The difficult thing is to understand how to use it with a keyboard. If you press the question mark, you get all these uh, keyboard hotkeys, and you, memorize exam is, is, a, is a difficult part. But you know, if, uh, but, uh, if you succeeded with Vim, you can succeed with this one. Uh, and you have the features of setting breakpoints. Uh, you can go up and down the stack. You, you can uh, set wash variables. So it's, it's a pretty cute thing. Uh, I think, and any questions about QDB? Okay, cool, cool. I think this is all I have to talk about. Again, shameless plug for, for my lightning talk. I'm gonna give a lightning talk about my research. Uh, that's gonna be the first lightning talk today. I hope it's gonna be very interesting. You can check out my research site. Uh, that, that's the first link or sign up to get updates about it on the second link. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, so if anyone has questions, please just line up in front of the microphone. And if there's anyone online that has a question, just please let the operator know so that we can pop you up on screen. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk, and I'd like to ask, so sometimes when I debug, I have many variables in the function, but I only care about how one of them changes. Is there a way, because I think it will be very spammy to, to snoop and, you know, see 10 where I only care for one to, to filter out the unwanted ones? Uh, I understand, but that doesn't exist. Sorry, okay. I, I, I was I was very tempted. Like I, I got a lot, lot of feature requests, like like yours, uh, when I was developing, and uh, I made the conscious decision to keep it as uh, simple as possible. Also, another decision I made is to not have any dependencies, because lots of people again use an old shitty code on Python 2. It, it supports it supports Python 2. I basically, I wanted to be a sort of a, a thing that doesn't have any any features, uh, too many features, but works everywhere with as little he headache as possible. You're welcome. Um, sorry, I, I was a bit confused by PUDP. PUDP. What, what is the difference to PDP? We use ah. it quite heavily. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and it's, it's, uh, it, it seems to be working for us quite well. So why should I use PUDP? So, so PDP, I haven't used it in years. I Last time I used it, which was maybe five or ten years ago, I hated it so much because, and I, I don't know if it changed since then, but it's like when you use PDP, Let's, you know, let's see if we have it, uh, let's see if there's like a screenshot of it, of it or something. Come on. Okay, there is, I can't find a screenshot, but anyway, when you use PDB, it's, you can't see the code, and it's like a sort of text-based adventure game from the 80s. It's like, you know, you always have to say, yes, I want to continue. Yes, I want to quit. Yes, I want this. And it's, uh, I, mean, I mean, I like seeing what's going on, personally. So with, with PODB, the fact that you just see the code, see the stack, see everything at once, uh, that for me is a huge deal. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, how does it look if you're interacting with uh, compiled C extensions or uh, built-ins or that sort of thing? Uh, it just skips them, same as the real debugger. Man, I love, I love uh, good questions. <laughs> and, uh, I'm not gonna print again, but really like it. Uh, I'm just curious, like how would you recommend using it operationally as a kind of a prettier traceback? Like in production? In production, yeah. It's like, you know, I, I know this thing fails a lot. I push it in production. 
Uh, I wouldn't want it to print out this trace of values, except if there's an exception. Uh, no, I wouldn't recommend it. No, <laughs> it would be hard. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it's conceivable to... Yeah, yeah, it, it is conceivable. It, it isn't a crazy idea, right? Maybe in some cases we would, would want to print all that. Uh, one thing that works well in, in production that I really love is the, uh, the Django debug page or the, what's, what's it called? Uh, what's, what's the sort of online service that does the same thing as a Django debug? Sentry. Uh, Sentry. And the, the nice thing is that when there's an exception, they show the entire stack. For each level in the stack, they show all the local variables. That is insane. For, for, for production uh, bug reporting, yeah. I mean, th th that's what I like. One of the previous companies I worked for, I, I basically implemented that. It just took Django and used the code from Django. So every time there is a production bug, we would get all the levels of the, of the, of the stack and, and the local variables for each. That was awesome. So, so much time saved in uh, investigating errors. Yeah, we are using it. But awesome. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a question or a feature request, but uh, it would be great if you could, uh, using uh, PySnooper, step over the lines, like after each line that it prints out, it would stop into a REPL as an option for an interactive, uh, like in a debugger, uh, view of the code. Would that be possible? Um, it would be possible, it's called a debugger. <laughs> yeah, so no, I, I wouldn't really want that in PySnooper. But thanks anyway. <laughs> so I, I read, read a bit of your documentation and found an option you do have. Wait, is, uh, start over and be oh. close to the mic. So I found an option that you have implemented, which is to disable debugging with an environment variable. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yes, uh, that's right. Let, let me show it. Oh, yeah. Um, and then I've got a question about it. Does it disable at the kind of trace level, or does it just disable the output? Uh, repeat your question. So when you disable the debugging with the trace with the environment variable, does it disable it at the trace level so nothing runs, or does it just disable the output, if that makes sense? Um, trace. Um, I think there is just logic in PySnooper that just tells it not to run if that happens. You know what? Let's even see the we can see, even see the code. Let's see. Ah, yes. Uh, okay. Now I understand. Now is it? I see the answer. I understand your question. Okay. Yes, it, it does disable it on the at level. It means that even like PySnooper becomes a no-op. Perfect. That's brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, do we have any questions online? Uh, don't don't be shy, online participants. No? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I guess it might be out of scope considering the previous uh, feature request slash question, but so you said that you can go deeper in the depth in the, in, yes. in the call stack, and I guess that there is no way to filter some of the calls only to not have the whole thing. Filter, or what do you mean filter? Um, like for instance, I want to only go deeper for one module and not for, for, for statistics module, but not for, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. That, that is also too, too esoteric for me to implement. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but I recommend grep. <laughs> and then you will just grab like one line. Or do you have a prefix by module? Uh, no, no, uh, you're right, you're right. Grep would be difficult because there is just one source line. So you're correct. Okay. Uh, I think we have quite time for one more question if you want to come up. Um, uh, good, good. The question for yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, the question was whether whether a PySnooper works on async. Th that's something I kind of looked into, but there wasn't enough demand, and nobody wanted to implement it. So this is actually a feature I would accept. Like if someone if someone uh, presents the use case for async and implements it, I, I'll, I'll merge that. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's thank from one more time uh, from everyone warmly. Thank you.